All right. So AJ, Ivan, Colby, and John are going to talk to us about the Bernoulli's and the harmonic series. And again, guys, the pins right here. If you need to annotate anything, okay? That's it's all you. Go for it. So uh, it all started mostly with this guy, like. How do you say his name? Leibniz. Who's that? Oh, Leibniz. 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 Um, he was the an I'm going to stand over like there just so it catches your audio. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, he was like kind of the founder of calculus, and I wouldn't say the founder of it, but he kind of made the calculator, and he made two mechanical calculators. He was also the uh, creator of artificial intelligence. And he kind of like contributed um, logical thinking with uh, calculating numbers. And he didn't quite finish his project, but um, I mean, he started it. And unfortunately, I mean, he couldn't finish it because he died, but uh, yeah. Uh oh. And then these are the Bernoulli brothers. Um, at least they're the two that, I think there was three of them. There's another one uh, named Daniel. Well, there's a lot, but the other one was named Daniel. But um, Jacob Bernoulli was uh, the oldest one and he was famous for the sum, summation of the infinite subject of probability and published Ars Conjectandi. And uh, Johan Bernoulli, who was a lot more uh, accomplished throughout his time. Uh, Uh, was famous for the infinitesimal calculus. He educated Euler and his Euler. youth, Euler and his youth, and um, he kind of spreaded Leibniz's calculus throughout uh, Western Europe, mostly, and uh, that's what he was famous for. You can go ahead, John. Okay, so uh, so in uh, sixteen, so uh, yeah, so in sixteen seventy two, Leibniz was working as a diplomat in uh, Paris, uh, and while he was there, uh, so he this was after he had gone to university and studied math, uh, but after that he'd gone into uh, uh, diplomacy and uh, civil service that sort of thing, uh, and while he was in Paris, he was mentored by a Dutch scientist named Christian Huygens. Uh, and uh, so he was. He just went to this guy and asked him, and told him, "I want to learn math. Like, how can I? Uh, what? How? How should I do that?" And so Huygens gave him a challenge, which was to find the sum of the reciprocals of triangular numbers. Uh, next. So, uh, the triangular numbers are just uh, the number of uh, dots in in a triangle that's formed. Uh, in a series of pictures like this. So like the first one's one, then you add, then you have that same one dot, then you add two, that's the next triangular number. Then you add three more dots to the next picture, then that's the next triangular number. Uh, so he was trying to find the uh, sum of reciprocals. Uh, and so the nth triangular number uh, is given by this formula, uh, n times n plus one over two, uh, next. And so here, this is sort of like a simple visual proof for why uh, that's the case. There's like n uh, dots on one side of the rectangle and uh, n plus one on the top, and it's the triangle is half the half that rectangle. Um, so how we went about finding the uh, some of this. So the some of the first uh, the sum of all the triangular numbers of this series, right? Uh, and so how he went about finding it is he took this series and he uh, divided it by two, right? So you have one half plus one sixth plus one twelfth plus one twentieth. And then he noticed that you could split these terms apart, uh, right? So, um, uh, so, uh, so remember how the formula for the nth, ter nth triangular number is uh, n times n plus one over two. Uh, 
So the formula for the reciprocal is two over n times n plus one, right? So here, like the nth number in the uh, second row is going to be one over n times n plus one. Uh, and so if you have uh, one over n minus one over n plus one, you're going to get one over uh, n times n plus one. You can work that out um, yourself if you want. Uh, so he did that. He converted into each of those individual terms there. And then he just rearranged the parentheses. So he got one plus one half, negative one half plus one half, and so on. Uh, and so then that's just s over two equals one. So s equals two. So he got uh, that the sum of the reciprocals of all the triangular numbers was two. And so that was sort of an original result to Leibniz, it seemed like. Uh, and I think AJ touched on this a little bit. Uh, but another important thing that Leibniz did was uh, he discovered calculus. Uh, so Newton actually discovered calculus first in 1666. But he didn't even publish that until, you know, many years later in 1704. And he didn't publish all of the things that he discovered until uh, 1736. And that was actually nine years after he died. So it wasn't even him who published it. Uh, but Leibniz sort of like some people that Newton was, friend, Newton was friends with uh, learned about the calculus just from Newton. And there were some like unpublished Newton manuscripts that were floating around. And Leibniz saw some of those and he, he didn't see the details, but he got the idea for calculus, it seemed like. Uh, and so then he sort of independently discovered all the other things that Newton had discovered uh, and published in uh, 1684. So he was like the first person to publish uh, the calculus. And you know he called it calculus, Newton called it fluxions, right? So th that's the reason we call it. Uh, calculus now is so fluxions possibly. Uh, and so there was a huge controversy about this because the English uh, thought Leibniz had plagiarized from Newton and all the continental mathematicians thought it was the other way around. Uh, so that was uh, you know, a significant part of the history of math that this chapter talks about. And so um, before we start getting into the harmonic series and its proof, um, we're gonna talk about two things. We're gonna talk about first, just what the infinite series and like infinite series is in general. And then we're also going to talk about the convergence of the geometric series because um, they're both kind of important for the background of um, the harmonic series. So first of all, 17th century, they knew that the infinite series was viewed as merely a sum of an endless collection of terms without guarantee of a finite sum. So they didn't know if it was going to diverge to infinity. Um, most times they said it probably will. Um, sometimes they don't know if it's going to diverge to a finite sum or converge to a finite sum. Um, such as the triangular numbers that John just explained. And so an example of that would just be adding up all the positive integers. And of course, they diverge to infinity, and that's pretty um, easy to see. And that when that happens, it, it means the series diverges to infinity. Um, there are, are infinite series, though, that sum to a finite number, just as we saw um, with the triangular numbers. An example of that would be one third, which is just the summation of three tenths plus three one hundredths plus three one thousandths plus three ten thousandths. And I think you get the picture. Um, an infinite series that converges to a number is a series that sums zeros in on a number as we infinitely add terms. So the terms themselves are infinite, but they converge to a single uh, number. And I said this before, but the an example of that would be like it says triangular um, numbers. So uh, the geometric series kind of is the thing that poses the question um, of the harmonic series uh, that Bernoulli uh, has to um, prove. So we're gonna look at this real quick. Uh, the, uh, the geometric series is just um, the summation of a term raised to the n plus one power. And this term has to be in between negative one and one. And I'm going to explain why it has to be in a little bit. And so we're going to set s equal to this series. And we're going to multiply both sides uh, by alpha, which it just if, if you can, that's just going to get rid of the a to the first term. I mean, if you multiply by alpha, just all of them are going to raise by one. Um, so uh, yeah, and then uh, now that we know that alpha s equals uh, this, we can just subtract um, alpha s from both sides of this equation. So that's going to look like s minus alpha s, and then s, which is uh, the series form of it, minus the series form of alpha s. And whenever you do that, you're just subtracting off every term that's from alpha squared and on, which just leaves you with what? It just leaves you with alpha on the right side. And so... Um, so we know that S minus alpha S equals alpha. If you factor out an S on the left-hand side, then you get S times one minus alpha divided by one minus alpha. And you know that S 
equals alpha over one minus alpha. So we know that. Um, therefore, alpha over one minus alpha equals that series. Um, and if alpha equals one third, we can see that one third plus one ninth plus one over three to the K is one third over one minus one third, which is just one half. So it converges to a finite number, even though it infinitely um, is adding terms. Now, why can't it be above one or below negative one? Well, if we have alpha equals two, then two plus two squared plus two to the third plus two to the fourth, uh, which is just two plus, you know, all these positive numbers equals <laughs> negative two, which is <laughs> really stupid. So I don't think that really makes any sense. And obviously you can see that any addition of two, even if it was just two plus four, any addition of two positive integers can't equal a negative number. So that's why um, it has to be between negative one and one. So this kind of told us some things about um, the convergence of infinite series. First of all, it showed us that in order for an infinite series to sum to a finite number, then the individual terms must converge to zero, not to infinity, obviously. Because I mean, what happened with two? They converge, they diverge to infinity and therefore its term did not converge to a singular uh, number. And then also, this isn't obvious, and this is why we have to have the proof um, for it. It also implies that there exists an infinite series that even though its terms converge to zero, it diverges to infinity. And so numbers that slowly get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller as you add them, and they converge to zero, the sum actually right, diverges to infinity, which is where Johann Bernoulli comes in and is like, allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm going to prove this harmonic series and prove that this uh, second implication is right. And um, so that so that kind of provides the question for the harmonic series. And the proof that he actually comes up with is so counterintuitive and bizarre that it was it's called a pathological counterexample because it's really hard to see that a bunch of really tiny, tiny, tiny fractions are gonna add up to an infinite series of uh, an infinite num number or not just towards one number. Um, and we can see that in the fact that it takes 83 terms just to get above five. So like if you were checking his work and you're like, well, I just summed up the first 82 terms and that's 4.99999, he's wrong. It, it doesn't converge to infinity, it converges to uh, five. Well, that's wrong because it takes like a quarter billion terms to reach above 20. And you can see how, why that's so counterintuitive because it's really hard to see if you were to um, actually just think about it. And so the proof actually rests on the summation of the convergence series, AKA the triangular numbers. Um, and I'll explain how, why that's so in about um, a minute here. The harmonic series is one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth plus you get the picture. Um, the proof introduces, he introduced a new series, which is just the harmonic series minus the first term. It's not minus the first term, but it's just, he just took out one. Um, he just introduced this series, one half plus one third plus one fourth. Um, remember that A equals one half plus one third plus one fourth. And then he changed it to put the numerators in numerical order. So he put one half plus two six plus three twelves plus four twentieths plus five thirties. And he's not gonna use this until later. So just re also remember that. Remember, especially this, A equals one half plus two six plus three twelves plus four twentieths and so on. And so next he designated uh, by C the series. This is just saying that whenever John was explaining the um, triangular numbers, he said that what S equals uh, one plus one third plus one six, dot, dot, dot. And then what did lightness do? He divided by two, right? So one half S equals one half plus one six plus one twelfth, right? So he he just sets this new series C equal to exactly that. He just sets it equal to those triangular numbers, one half S. He, he sets it equal to one half S and he knows that that equals one. And that's why he's gonna be able to use this because now he's gonna have two sides in the equation he can work with. And so what he does next is, um, which this kind of ends up being a problem later with modern mathematicians, but he just kind of subtracts the infinite series of numbers. Just, he just subtracts one half in the first term from each and every seri new series that he creates. So he subtracts one half off of D, which is just C minus one half, and there's one minus one half, which is just one half. And then he subtracts one six off of D, which is one half minus one six, which is one third. And you can see the progression that he goes down. What, and what he does next is really uh, important. So he has two sides in the equation, as I mentioned, right? And so what he's going to do is that he's going to add up all of these, and he's going to add up this side of the equation as well. He's just going to add them, kind of con condense them down to a kind of singular term almost. 
So if he adds up all these on the left-hand side, he's just going to be adding up all these rows, right? All the common the common terms. So one half plus the two one six plus the three one twelve plus the four one twenty. So you might see where he's going with this. And then he's going to be adding up one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth. Well, on the left side, one one half plus the two one six plus the three one half. What does that equal? One half plus two six plus three twelves plus four twenties and I told you to remember that that's A. That's just what he came up with earlier. Whenever he changed A into um, that numerically uh, sequenced numerators. And then on the right-hand side, he adds up one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth. And that's just one plus A, which is, you can see that. But what is this? What is one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth? Does anybody know what that is? That's the harmonic series. That's literally just the harmonic series. He just found that the harmonic series actually equals one plus a, which equals a. And so he said the, the whole equals a part. And obviously no, in, no finite quantity can equal more, one more than itself. And so if he knows that a equals one plus a, which is an infinite quantity, and he knows that one plus a is the harmonic series, then there you go. He just proved that the harmonic series is an infinite series. He just proved that it's one plus a number, which is infinite, obviously. And so, yeah, that, there you go. That's the proof. Are there any questions on that? Is there anything that was like super unclear about that? I thought it was kind of simple, um, but. Um, you were at the very beginning, it was like A and S. And you're really making me. That was that was the that was the geometric uh, convergence series, which was just giving us the the question. It posed the question of can there be an infinite series? Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. I got you. I got you. So, uh, wait, no, I'm still too far. So basically. He multiplied both sides by a, right? Alpha. Alpha, my bad. Alpha, and he finds this. Yeah. Okay. So now that he knows that this is true, what he just found, he's just going to take the original and he's just going to subtract alpha s from both sides. So he subtracts s minus alpha s, but alpha s is also this. So he's not going to subtract alpha s from this side because he wants to be able to like, it's like like terms almost. He wants to subtract the thing that has like terms from it. And so he's just, he just subtracts this from this. So this from this, this is alpha, this is alpha s. And then all these cancel with all of these. Okay. And this just becomes alpha. The one to the left is s alpha. Oh yeah, my bad, s. I did not mean to say that. So yeah, is that, is that clear now as far as? Are there any other questions about the harmonic series itself? So can you go to kind of where you had that grid? Oh, the big grid of numbers and stuff. Yeah. That I mean, uh, let's see. Uh, yada, 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 yada. There we go. Right here. So basically what you're saying is if you add down columns. Yeah, if you add down this column, which is just the addition of all this. So you're going to get one half. One half. Plus two sixths. Plus two sixths. One third. Yeah, one plus half. three twelfths, which is a fourth. Yeah, we did not fourth. And then plus four twentieths, which is a fifth. Which is a fifth. Plus, plus etc. Plus one sixth plus nothing. Yeah, yeah. So it's one half plus a third plus a fourth, which is basically the harmonic series minus its first term. Minus its first term. But then if you add across rows, you get a half plus a sixth plus etc. That's the triangular numbers, which is one. Subtract half off from the next row. And that's just a half plus a third. Plus a third. So weirdly, if you add down the columns, you get a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth, etc. But if that's I add true. across rows, I get one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, etc. Yeah. Which yeah. means that the thing is equal to one plus the thing. One plus the thing, which is why. So and, and actually, that's like one of the biggest critiques of it by his own brother, Jakob. He, he, uh, he said, well, first of all, mathematicians are like, why in the world would he attack it this way? This is so weird because they would say like, there's a, there's a series N such that there's this amount of, and they would go through like, you know, a more logical process.
But um, and then he was kind of I, I kind of mentioned this earlier. He was just kind of like adding and subtracting, just creating new harmonic like series and stuff. Like, oh, well, this series is just this series minus its first term, and he's just kind of playing around with infinite series as if they're just normal numbers or something. And you can't you can't really do that as much. <laughs> and so his own brother Jakob points out he was like, we don't know if the sum of an infinite series equals its final term, like if it vanishes or if it's infinite. So like whenever he has the dot dot dots, he's like, is that a finite, is that an infinite series or a finite series? We don't know if the harmonic series is infinite because you didn't list every single number in the series. You just listed like the first four. So how am I supposed to know that it's actually um, infinite? So that's kind of like his knock on him saying like, it doesn't make any sense or something. But in any case, we, we can't overlook the ingenious and clever approach that he took. It's very um, simple and kind of, it's just very like, interesting how he went about it. And he, he did prove it. I mean, it's true. It's it's, it's true. It, it does diverge to infinity. So, yep. That's, that's it. All right. I'm going to be talking about the brachistochrone, which is um, kind of a fancy word. It it um, it means a curve. So it I think I think brachistochrone is Greek for shortest time, and so basically. This, there was a challenge issued by Johann Bernoulli um, in June of 1696. And he said um, he had kind of solved this own, his own problem beforehand. Um, I'll take my mask off. And he said in Leibniz's journal, the Acta Eruditorum, he said um, he, he issued this problem, uh, this challenge problem. He said, I will give you guys till next year um, to solve it, if anyone can solve it, that's great. I don't think he had an actual like money reward, but like those kind of challenge problems were were big back in that back in the time. They could make or break um, your kind of math reputation. Um, and in Johann's words himself, he said, "You could bring eternal fame um, to your to your name as a mathematician. You could be known um, forever, pretty much, if you could solve these kinds of challenge problems." Um, so the, the problem itself um, is you have two points, you have A and you have B, um, and you, you want to be able to connect A and B such that if you rolled a ball or some sort of sphere at A, it would reach B as fast as possible. And so you might, you might think, I have a couple curves up there, you might think, well, um, we want to just go there as as straight as possible, right? That's the, the shortest amount of material. So surely that'd be a good, good approach. And he actually, when he published this, he gave a warning and said, don't do that. Just don't do it. It's, it's, not, it's not the right answer. <laughs> and so maybe you wanna like accelerate really fast and then like shoot across, um, which to me, that would, that would kind of make the most sense because you're, you're getting speed and then you're going. Um, but that's actually also the wrong answer. Um, and so, and then he also kind of gave a, a little hint, a little tease. He said, uh, the curve is actually well known to a lot of mathematicians. So you already know it. So you have no excuse not to solve the problem, pretty much is what he's saying. Um, and he, yeah, he gave a deadline. Uh, he said, so he, he published that in the Acta Eruditorum in June of 1696. And he said, January 1st, 1697 is the deadline. No more submissions by then. Um, only one person in the entire world solved it <laughs> by that point, and that was actually Leibniz himself. <laughs> so the person who ran the, the journal. So Leibniz actually asked for uh, kind of ex an extension to the problem. He said, um, yeah, that didn't really work out so well. We want kind of more pu publicity for this. Let's, let's extend the deadline and let's actually send it some places so that we can get more kind of pu publicity to this challenge. And so um, Johan said, fine, okay, I'll, I'll extend it to Easter of this year, um, and we'll see, we'll see what can happen by then. So, um, Johan actually, um, as, um, as John mentioned earlier, Leibniz and Newton kind of, they kind of, um, there's, there's a controversy between, like, who actually invented calculus, because, like, Newton invented it first, but he didn't publish it for, like, 40 years and Leibniz had it and published it first and kind of got all the fame first. And then Newton came in and was like, yeah, I actually kind of solved that way earlier. Um, and so 
um, the Bernoullis were kind of, they were mentored by Leibniz. And so they were kind of cited uh, for Leibniz and Johann was very much an advocate for Leibniz. In fact, like um, he, there's a parallel in the book that like um, there was uh, Thomas Huxley who was a big advocate for um, uh, no, Darwin, Charles, Charles Darwin, um, who later on, obviously, um, and he was known as the, the bulldog of, Dar of Darwin, or Darwin's bulldog or something like that. And so Johann has been kind of described as Leibniz's bulldog. And so he's kind of like this fierce advocate saying, no, no, Leibniz was the guy who created this. He needs all the credit because obviously he was mentored by Leibniz. So that makes sense. So he, he, um, there's a few subtle hints um, in the things that he wrote that were kind of jabs at Newton for this problem um, because Newton was obviously a genius. And so Johann wanted to prove kind of his, that he was on the same standard as Newton and that he could best Newton in something. And so he was kind of, he would jab at him and talk about like golden proofs um, or golden methods that weren't published and stuff, kind of talking about calculus and um, fluxions and stuff like that. Um, and in fact, he actually specific, specifically sent this problem straight to England. He said, I'm going to put this in an envelope, we're sending it straight to England, so there can be no confusion. I'm challenging Newton, which is not a good idea. <laughs> um, so Isaac Newton at this point, he was later on in life, um, he had already done a ton of mathematics um, stuff, and he, he had already gotten really famous. Um, and he was working at the Mint at this time. Um, trying to solve a bunch of problems. The currency of the day had so many flaws and it was a big problem. And he was trying to solve that problem. Um, and they were, they were in the middle of the, the great recoinage as the book calls it, um, which is basically him trying to figure out how are we gonna make coins good? And actually that process is what, um, what made him become a knight. He was knighted for his contributions to that. So he was actually at work when the letter reached England, um, he came home at um, four in the afternoon, and this is kind of chronicled by his niece um, at the time because he was living with her because uh, he was old and weak. Um, <laughs> and so he came home from work, very tired from all the recoinage work and stuff, came home at four in the afternoon, and he had solved the problem by 4 a.m. He did not sleep the entire night. He said, I'm gonna solve this. He pulled an all-nighter and it was done by 4 a.m which is just insane. Like it took over the six month period, it was open to like the kind of small community around Leibniz. Only one person solved it and it was Leibniz himself. Um, but then Newton gets in and is like, yeah, easy. Um, and in fact, he has been said to have said, I do not love to be teased by foreigners about mathematical things. So it's like, he's just like, these are trivial matters. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't come at me, at me with this kind of thing. Um, so, what is the solution? Um, the solution is a cycloid, which um, is basically, if you take a circle, um, here, let me, let me draw it. So you have kind of a line and you take a circle, a part in my terrible drawing skills, and then you kind of track a point on that circle. And then as the circle, let me try and do this, as the circle kind of rolls, you'll get a different point. You, you can kind of track that point on the circle as it rolls. And that curve that you get will look something like, something like that, um, if that makes sense. You kind of track that and you get these kind of bumps. Um, and this had been known for a long time. In fact, um, Huygens, which was Leibniz's mentor, kind of, and Pascal were two people who kind of worked on the cycloid a whole bunch. Um, and so he actually said, so Johan was like, surprise guys, it's the cycloid, this thing that you guys have known about, pretty famous curve, you guys should have known this. Um, and another thing that the book didn't mention that I find very interesting is there's another property of that, of that same curve. Oh, and yeah, so something that I didn't really mention there. Obviously the cycloid is like this. So what you do is you take like a section of it and you turn it upside down and you do kind of like, I, I'm really bad at drawing, but you kind of like take that curve and make it upside down and then put it like that. Um, and so another, yeah, another um, property of this curve is it's also called a totochrome, which means uh, same time. So if you have multiple of these curves, 
right next to each other. So let's say you have three of those curves right next to each other. And you're kind of doing like, you know, like a, uh, a Pinewood Derby little, you, you know, you make those little cars and you send them down the track. So you, you do that same thing. You have these three curves and you put one ball at the top, one ball in the middle and one ball an inch away from the end. And let's say in a perfect frictionless world, you drop all three at the same time. And you might think, oh, the bottom one's gonna hit first. Obviously it's an inch away from the end. Um, but no, they actually all hit the, they will all hit the end at the exact same time, um, which I find to be awesome. That's, that's, it's so counterintuitive to me, um, but you can see this in action. Um, Mythbusters and Vsauce, um, two kind of famous YouTube channels, did a collaboration and they kind of, um, they kind of showed an example of that. Um, so, um, so who, who are the people who solved this problem by Easter? Because there were actually more than just uh, Leibniz and uh, Newton. There was Johann, obviously, who solved it before he even announced it. Um, and then Leibniz and then Jakob was actually able to solve this, um, much to Johann's dismay. He was kind of competitive with his, with his brother. And so uh, his brother was able to um, come up with a solution. And then uh, Marquis de L'Hôpital was able to come up with a solution. And he's famous for L'Hôpital's rule, um, calculus. Uh, and then Newton did not actually sign his name or anything on his, on his letter that he sent back in on his submission. He just kind of sent it in with an English um, stamp on it. Um, and as uh, Leibniz opened it, he, he was in awe of the brilliance of the solution. Um, and it is, it's rumored to have, he, he's rumored to have said that um, he can, he recognized the line by his paw. So he's able to see, oh yeah, that's Newton. <laughs> And that's, that's pretty much it. Questions? Yeah, you guys have any questions? Oh, is a cyclone different than a circle? Yeah, so it's, it's, let me, so it's not like a semicircle. So a semicircle would be kind of more taller, I guess. It's more, um, and again, I'm terrible at drawing. It's more, it's a little bit more flat. It looks similar to a semicircle, but it's not. So yeah. like hypothetically, would it not be the best way to have like roads to have like bike roads to like off the line? Um, <laughs> well, maybe, but that would be extremely difficult. <laughs> like, like hypothetically, would that be the best? Way? I mean, no, I'm going to say no, because cars are not propelled by rolling. Um, they are, but it, this, whenever you're touching the ground, there's no kinetic friction. It's all static friction because you're, you're, the bottom of your tire is not actually rubbing on the ground. If it is, your car is not working properly. Um, <laughs> so uh, for here, you've got something rolling down, there, um, which again, also, I guess is Static friction, because if you look at the sphere, it's anyways, you're not really rolling the whole car down the road. You're rolling just the tires. And so I feel like the current system is probably the best and the cheapest, because you don't want to really be like, oh, let's make this giant circle and roll it on the ground and then create a cycloid curve and see, oh, I mean, maybe, maybe it would have some benefits, but I feel like that would be unnecessary. Any other questions? I, I will remark that there was a lot of speculation at some point that the solution would have something to do with a pendulum swing. Because if you drop a pendulum, like whether you drop it from really high or from like really low, like the same amount of time, roughly the same amount of time will pass if you know to complete one cycle of the swing, does that make sense? So uh, there was some speculation that that would be part of the curve, but it turns out the cycloid was just the ticket. Now in Calc two, you'll talk a fair amount about the cycloid, uh, and you'll actually write down an equation for the curve that gives that gives the cycloid itself. Um, so there you'll actually you'll you actually get to see a full-fledged solution to, to like how you would write down an equation that describes the cycloid itself. 
So that's, that's an interesting problem for sure. And you do things like compute the distance, uh, like for one arc of the cycloid. So suppose you have uh, like a one foot radius on your wheel, one foot. Do you care to, and you know what you're doing, you're tracking like a nail on the edge of the tire as it rolls. Anybody wanna take a guess how long one arc of that cycloid is gonna be if I have a one foot radius tire? Pi, two pi, eight, eight, okay. So the, the length of one arc of the cycloid will actually be eight feet, which is kind of weird. In general, if your wheel has a radius R, like whatever R is, R, you know, R inches, R feet or whatever, then, then the, the length of one arc of the cycloid will be eight times that radius, which is bizarre. And you actually show that in top two. So, or at least I do when I teach it, I don't know, okay. Other questions? Um, there's a great book. Uh, I, I, have, I almost used it for this class instead of Journey Through Genius, but I think Journey Through Genius is fantastic. There's another book called Great Feuds in Mathematics. And there's a, um, there's a chapter devoted to Leibniz and Newton. Uh, and it's a fantastic chapter. Uh, what was weird is, is Leibniz really in his group kind of seemed like, I don't know, Leib Newton seemed like he was kind of laying low, almost like he was above the fray. He was kind of an old, older guy at the time. It was like, look, I don't have anything to prove. Yeah, I invented it. You know, I, I kind of think you stole my work. There was actually uh, you know, recorded correspondence of letters between Newton and Leibniz. And Leibniz was kind of picking up pieces and he, he redeveloped the calculus with other notation. You could thank him for the D, you know, the DY, DX notation and things like that. Newton was more of the prime guy, prime, 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 you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, so those two, those two notations are kind of the Newtonian versus the Leibnizian notations, okay? Uh, but in the chapter, it's, it's kind of interesting because you can kind of feel like Newton is like, whatever, you know, I did it 40 years ago. He actually tried to explain the calculus to people and people didn't understand what he was talking about. It's like a horrible lecture. Uh, <laughs> nobody could understand what he was talking about half the time. It was totally weird. Leibniz was kind of this charismatic individual that people really could relate to. His notation actually is superior to Newton's, if you're trying to understand the calculus for the first time, and people were like, man, this is amazing. And, and Newton's like, oh man, I did that. You know, I just didn't publish it, crying out loud. Uh, so there's a great sort of articulation of the controversy there. There's a whole bunch of other controversies as well. One of them is between uh, uh, Huxley, the guy that you mentioned, and uh, sort of a Jewish mathematician. I want, uh, uh, so Huxley was kind of defending Darwinian, uh, like Darwinian evolution, and this other guy, I think it was uh, Jacobson or something. Yeah, I've heard about that. Uh, so about Jacobson that. was uh, was saying, "Look, you you idiot! Uh, how in the world could the Earth have ever been a ball of magma? Uh, you know, the Earth's crust would be this thick, but it's really only this thick. You know, so he he was kind of arguing." back then. And actually, I think it's still like a legitimate question. Yeah. But Huxley just went, nah, I don't know what you're <laughs> talking about. So anyways, any other questions? So great feuds in mathematics. If you want some additional reading, uh, that's, a, that's a great book. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Thanks, John.